So let's go ahead and get our panel started here. This is going to be on um, learning assessment strategies. And uh, so the way I would like to do this is um, I'm going to allow you guys to just introduce yourselves and uh, talk a little bit about your experience, if you don't mind, please. And um, also share just right up front, because we only have a short time, of um, sort of some things that you may have thought about and prepared of assessment strategies that you really want to get out. Just like, well, this is what I do, and this has worked really well. And then um, as we have questions and, and so forth, we'll go over those. So if you don't mind, um, Camille, if you begin and um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Your, no, it's on. It's on. And okay. some experience. And then um, tell us a little bit about how you do your assessments and some of the some okay. of the things you do that you want to share. So I'm Camille Fairborn. I teach statistics uh, out of the Brigham City campus. I do the intro stats and the business stats, both as a broadcast class and online each semester. Well, not broadcast in the summer, but anyway. Um, as far as assessments goes, the thing that I'm most excited about right now is what I do with group homework in my business stats class. So. I really wanted to maintain the uh, paper and pencil exams. It's a traditional kind of stat exam where here's a hypothesis test and I want them to write down all of the steps and do the calculations. But in an online class especially, it's very difficult to come up with easily gradable things that you can deliver at a distance and at scale. So I was stuck with having to do multiple choice and short fill in the blank and you know, step by step little bits of the hypothesis test without having them to do the whole thing start to finish. So I wanted them to have practice in a formative way of the kind of things that I would ask them on the exam and that wasn't working with the fill in the blank, multiple choice kind of assessments that are built into an online class. So rather, and I also didn't want to grade 40 assignments each week of these written out things. So what I have my students do is they'll print out the group homework for the week, which is basically two semesters ago's test questions for that module. And they have to handwrite their answers to this and then somehow scan it, upload it to Canvas so they can take a picture with their phone. Most students don't have a problem with that. Getting it right side up, they have a problem with. But anyway, <laughs> that one drives me crazy. I'm like, anyway. Um, so anyway, they, they submit an individual submission. And then I download all of those and put them into groups. And then they have three days to meet as a group, either in Skype or some of them do it with group chat or group texting on their phones. Um, some of them just use the discussion board in Canvas. And then they come as a group to, this is our group answer to these questions. And then one person will rewrite their solutions and submit that for the group. So in a, stu in a class of 40, I grade about eight, seven or eight assignments a week for content. So they get credit for their individual work just for completion. Did you, did you turn something in? Did you try it? And then they get graded on a basically point by point basis on completion and correctness as a group. So that's, what, that's been working really well for me. I've been trying to let other people know about that, and I'd be happy to talk with any of you in more detail about that. Hi, I'm Kathy Farron Bullock. I'm here on this campus. I'm in the Journalism and Communication Department. Um, I teach our large Intro to Mass Communication class, which is a survey class, gen ed class. Um, I teach communication research methods, um, which is a quantitative intensive class to about 30, 35 students a semester. I teach a mass communication ethics class, um, upper division, usually about 10, 12 students. That's about every other year. And I teach a, a feature writing class, magazine freelancing class. And one of the things I am most excited about right now is um, I've tried using learning portfolios in my upper division uh, mass communication ethics class because um, the whole point of the class is to encourage students to um, sort of hone their own moral reasoning processes. And then you come to the end and it's like, I really want to evaluate student learning. How can I tell whether the students are learning or not? Um, and a colleague recommended trying learning portfolios and I gave it a try. 
And the whole idea there is that um, at the very beginning of the semester, um, the students write down what their learning goals are. So they make a, just a short list, maybe three, four learning goals. I collect those so I know what they want to be working toward during the semester. Um, and I want to make sure that these are really the kinds of goals they could document progress on, not something too vague. Um, so they start by letting me know what their goals are. Then all our different assignments and exercises over the course of the semester are designed to help them make progress toward those goals. They're keeping a journal, so they're tracking um, their progress. They're critiquing Journal of Mass Media Ethics articles. We have essay exams. They have um, in class um, an assignment where they have to clip something from the media and show how it relates to the stuff we've been talking about. And then by the end of the semester, they draft a narrative, a self-reflective narrative, no more than 10, 12 double spaced pages where they say these were my learning goals this is the progress I think I've made or the progress I wanted to make and didn't make be honest about it and then they have to document that progress so instead of me trying to guess you know are you making progress on these things um, they're saying I think I'm making progress here's why I think I'm making progress um, and I kind of did a little informal content analysis of their learning portfolios. Most of them said they were making progress on their goals. Of course, they're going to say that, right? That's the right thing to say, social desirability here. Um, but then they have to document it. And when I got into their appendices, um, with just one exception out of the 12 students, all except one really adequately documented progress um, by drawing on their journals and drawing on case studies we talked about and they were able to to start by saying this was what I was thinking at the beginning this is what I'm thinking now um, and I was really kind of excited about the way that was helping me document student learning so hi uh, my name is Courtney Stewart I'm in Teal teacher education and leadership and I'm in the end leadership side of that acronym I'm an instructional leadership group faculty member there so I help Teachers that want to come back and be principals, uh, get their master's and principal license, and then also if they want to do a doctorate, um, I help them with that. So I teach mainly graduate level, actually only graduate level courses. Um, but I kind of wanted to deviate a little, and um, I actually have a love-hate relationship with assessment because I was not too long ago on the other end of that receiving the brunt of every assessment thrown at me from my college professor. So I've really tried to take the view of authentic assessment. And unfortunately, or fortunately, um, I teach a lot of my classes online. And so I've tried to build that into my online classes, incorporating both two different types, a formative and a summative assessment. And so my formative assessments are checking for knowledge. And I've incorporated those, like in the last panel, Sylvia was talking about this low pressure quizzes. And you, I give them three chances to take the quiz. They can take it three times. They have to pass with an 80 before they can move on to the next content. But the emphasis is on the learning. And so that's a check for understanding for me and also a formative assessment for them to check for knowledge. The second thing I do is I give them choice in assessment. I give them lots of opportunities to choose and pick which type of assessment they're going to give to me. Um, and I try to be application based. So if we're talking about differentiated instruction this week in my class, I have them go and observe a teacher that's incorporating that in their school, or they go and they find a, an article about it, and they'll do a, an analysis of the article. I give them options to choose what best meets their way of showing me they learned that content. Um, and so those are a couple ideas that I incorporate now in my online classes. Hi, I'm Pam Dupin Bryant, and I'm out of the Huntsman School of Business and Management Information Systems, and I teach at the Tooele Regional Campus. And um, I have a bunch of things I like to share, but one thing I would, um, would like to talk about is um, projects and assessment of projects. Just by a quick show of hands, how many of you do a cumulative project um, at the end, a project or some sort of capstone at the end of the, the semester? Okay, a good chunk. A lot of us do that. And over the years, um, w we get this sort of, here's the project, here's the learning objectives, what I want you, what I want to see in this project. And this project's supposed to be this, you know, um, rainbows and unicorns and, you know, all come together at the end and show every learning objective that I have for the course. 
and that's all fine, right? But how, just like with you, um, that is, you know, the formative, that project I get at the end. Um, the summative piece that has worked for me over the years is to have what I call project prep exer um, exercises. So, you know, preparation exercises. And it's nothing new in the educational realm. It's just meet these, you know, things along the way. Um, in, in systems design, we talk about the systems development life cycle. And so I match all of mine to that life cycle. Life cycle. There's deliverables at every phase up to the final project. And what that enables me to do is when they turn in their first project prep exercise, exercise is that just similar to you is that yeah they're gonna get points but if it's um, not quite there then I give them detailed feedback they can resubmit for full credit and they like that because they should because if they don't resubmit it then by the time we get to that project there's gonna be you know a gap so each one of those it takes a lot of intensity from from me as well um, I give them detailed rubrics at the beginning of the semester of the things that I expect for each of the you know the deliverables along the way and if they turn something in that's not quite there well in industry that's what they're gonna get is feedback fix it so that when you do get to the project and what it, it enables me is all these little summative projects along the way that are very defined rubric I give lots of feedback um, as we're going through is that when they do get to that formative piece the projects are so much easier for me to grade because I've been seeing them all along and helping them and, and getting to that point so um, I know you probably all do a variation of that well show of hands how many of you do something similar to where yeah, and I think the big thing for me over the years was just to define it more clearly that these count and that there's no um, concern if you make a mistake. Make a mistake, that's what my classroom is for, that in the end we want you to have this, this um, finished um, nice pro project, product. So something that I was sort of keen in on, and you start really with it, Kathy, is um, uh, you talked about portfolios and then authentic assessments and projects. Are we talking about the same? Are, is a portfolio a project? Is is that is it a, a culmination of what's gone on through the term? Or I guess my other question is, why are we not seeing more portfolios as the the final assessment um, item? I think, um, I think a portfolio is one form of project. I think it's one direction it can take, but I wouldn't think it would have to be the only one. With the learning portfolio, you are building toward it um, during the whole semester, and the students have a lot of flexibility in deciding what pieces they're then going to then gonna take and include in the portfolio to show, you know, to show how they're meeting their individual goals. But I think that you know, that's just one kind of project that would sort of serve the same end. Yeah, and on that same note, for like a programming class that I teach, there's going to be a project, and then they can share that with their future employers or other, but, but there's other classes where it might not be as easy to have an actual product, like here's a program I created, and a portfolio is a great piece to have because they can carry that on. So I think the portfolio, probably more so if it's a lot of little things that, that are um, not related, I mean related, but not like here's the project. You, so I think they're both great ideas and I think that it's a service to our students to have something when they leave our class sure we've assessed them and here's your grade see ya right but to actually have that something that they can take out and show prospective employers or you know other classes or what have you is just something that you know if we can send them out with that then they're one step up in getting a job and in their future so. can I add one thing to that um, in our field teachers that are going to become principals, if we were to give them a portfolio, rarely will a district take a look at that portfolio. And so the time dedicated in building that portfolio doesn't yield to those students as much. And me on the instructive side, um, grading a portfolio is tough because it's so much work to go through that. I mean, it's the whole course or in our department, we actually have a culminating portfolio for the whole course or for the whole uh, program that they go through. And so it's a ton of work to go through. So I think I've, we've kind of moved away from that portfolio as a culminating um, program, um, but I can see the benefit in other, you know, even sciences or even in business where they could take that with when they're looking for jobs. One other thing I'd add is one of the purposes with the learning portfolio and something like a mass media ethics class is it's just really the beginning. Um, they keep thinking about this. This is 
part of what I want them to be doing is thinking about their own thinking. How are they thinking? Um, and so this is the beginning of that. And my hope is that they continue working on those goals and working on those things they've defined as important to them. So it's, in a way, it's not, the whole point there is not to show this to an employer necessarily. Um, I've got other classes where I do more, you know, let's show the employer this end product, the feature article or the computer assistive reporting project or whatever. But with this, it's more um, self-reflective and them, in, you know, continuing to improve moral reasoning processes. I think it's really good for that. So, okay, to switch gears here a little bit, um, I want to talk, ask some questions about assessment design and work. There's, um, I remember back in my college days, and I've heard this from many students, is, well, I didn't learn that. It was on the test, but it wasn't in my material. I never learned that's not fair or something of that, that nature. So, Courtney, you talked about authentic design, and Camille, I know you've done a lot of objectives, so you've designed your course intentionally using them objectives and had, had taught your, designed it all the way through to your assessments. So if you could both kind of address those and, and of course the rest of you, of, of how you design your assessments. How do you ensure that you're, you're measuring what you need to measure and it's the level and, and also it's in line with what you have been teaching? Well, I think one way is, as the, uh, has been mentioned, is a rubric. I mean, having that beforehand tells them explicitly what you're going to be looking for. But the problem is, is also a rubric uh, can be both your saving grace and also the, the millstone around your neck that you're tied to that when there's a deviation from it. But I think that's one way is to clarify so that there are no surprises, is they know explicitly um, what you're going to be looking for in those types of assessments so there aren't any surprises. Oftentimes with our multiple choice final exams, we can't give them a rubric to tell them what's going to be on there. In in my, most of my classes, my culminating projects are usually reflective papers or research papers or uh, more analytical thoughts from them where they've applied the content knowledge and in, in, in writing. So um, that's one thing I would add. Well, in, in teaching statistics, most of what I do is very measurable. So it's, very, it, it's been a, a long road to convince me that I had to go and actually write the student will be able to objectives. That was a really hard thing for me to, to embrace uh, culturally. It's, objectives have been a, a problem in mathematics for about as long as I've been involved in it. Um, but I finally did sit down and write. I looked at everything that was in my course, um, topic by topic, uh, problem by problem. I had all these uh, quiz questions and exam questions that I'd built up over the years, but to then w look through and say, do I really need to be teaching this? And, and so, yes, I, I make a decision, yes, I do want to include this. And in, in that, then, I've built in why I want that included. And when I go to write the objective, I write it in such a way that the, the assessment question is built into the objective. So it will say something like, Given a histogram, a student will be able to visually estimate the mean, median, and standard deviation. And so that right there says that when it's time to do the assessment, I show them a histogram and ask them to visually estimate the mean, median, and standard deviation. So in each of my objectives now, there is a, a test question basically written into the objectives. And when I sit down to, or when you know, review for the exam comes, I can just put all these objectives on the slides and we can go through them one at a time and say, okay, do you know how to do this? Can you calculate the RMS error? Can you, can you construct a histogram? Can you use it this way and that way? Can you find an area? Um, these kinds of things are all just listed out for students. And they, I do get that they say this was very fair. I knew what I was going into. I, I know what I have to be able to do. And then I just make the test based on those things. So. But it takes an enormous amount of effort to do that. Like, oh my god, I'm so tired. <laughs> One thing that um, over the years, and, and we all do this, is we think, oh yes, we have these learning objectives and we are you know, assessing them properly and so forth. And you know, it's all lining up beautifully. Um, a couple years ago, I sent out um, my resources, my Canvas, my 
syllabi, you know, all of this to um, some industry professionals to do a, an assessment. You know, we're always asked to have peer assessment from um, other faculty members and so forth, but I thought, hey, this will be a great idea. And one of the, the web designers went through my course and was like, well, you have your, on your rubric that they're going to align to the Amer American Disability Act, um, but nowhere in your learning objective do you say anything about that being, you know, a learning objective? And, you know, then they're, oh, well, well, I, you know, I do it, but I totally just added that over the years as the assessment. But I hadn't really, you know, focused on, I mean, we, we discuss it in class and we go through all of those things, but it was something as simple as having someone look and go, but you don't have it as a learning objective. I was still doing it, um, but it, I guess what I'm just trying to say is sometimes we, we intentionally think we're writing great objectives and assessing our course, but humble yourself, throw it out there, have other um, you know, principals look at what you're doing and see are we really assessing or even teaching what we think we're teaching. So sometimes it's getting that extra um, outside view that you know, humbles us all that, hey, we're not as great as we think and we can improve on this assessment process. So. Now I want to bring forward a comment that was made this morning um, in a previous panel, which is uh, what I wish I had known when I started teaching. And um, one of the comments that was made that they had wished they had known, and they all agreed about on this, that they had documented more of their teaching, that they had kept track of it. So this is a great example and a great sort of method or way or strategy to document your teaching through your objectives and keeping track of those and then following up with them and using those as even your promotion and tenure um, uh, evidence that you're using. So, um, so we're almost out of time here, but um, there's something that, I, I don't remember who brought this up, but it was, um, it was about uh, uh, st allowing students to fail. And it's a question that I, I wanted to, to ask all of you and just sort of get your insights of, um, of uh, I asking you whether there's a value in failure in, for, by your students. And do, do you see what I'm asking there? And, and, and where is it appropriate and where is it beneficial in terms of the teaching and learning process? And, and then how do you manage that and structure it? Well, I, I'll just say quick, um, Tony Wagner says that it's not pass or fail, it's iteration. That it's the next level that learning from that previous ex example, but that's my quick response. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about the group homework, and my favorite comment that I'll see is they'll turn in their individual assignment, and then on the message board they'll say, oh, I see where I messed up on number five. And it's very low stakes. I mean, they just have to basically write something down to turn it in. But I use, I guess, social pressure that they don't want to appear like an idiot week after week to their group members that they actually have to try. And, but then to see, to see them going back and saying, oh, you got a different answer than I did. Why do we have different answers? And to see that go back and forth where they're not being assessed on correctness at the beginning. And so there's that peer interaction that goes on. The other thing that I do is in the, in the multiple choice por portion, the lecture, you know, evaluate portion that I do, uh, they either have unlimited tries so they can go and try it as many times as they want. And I do a lot of fill in the blank. So what's the lower limit of the confidence interval and round to three decimal places. So they put their number in and they hit check answer and it will say right or wrong. And then they can go back and go, well, wait, why did I get that wrong? And, and they can keep going until they get it right, which is, again, I think, allowing them to fail. There's no penalty to putting a wrong answer in. You can just hit reset and try a different number. And I think that helps them, too. I think there's nothing more powerful than learning from our own mistakes, and we all do it all through our lives, right? So um, in something like my feature writing class, which is uh, an upper division um, magazine freelancing class, again, it's back to the idea of iteration. Students write a story, um, and then we all together, you know, they, I critique it and edit it for them. Their colleagues, their peers do. By doing that, they're, they're learning the editing process, the coaching process. Um, and I think as the students, we try not to look at it as failure, but, you know, when it comes right down to it, a lot of those first stories would be failures. No editor would buy that piece. They then do another draft. 
it gets better. Every draft they do, it gets better. The second story they do is better than the first. So it's kind of learning, learning as you go, learning from your own mistakes, practicing, and by the time we're done, we have students placing articles with national magazines. Not all of them, but they, I think they all, by the end, have a sense that they've improved, they're better than they were at the beginning, and can feel you know, good about that. But um, just sort of learning from their own mistakes and trying to keep things open for that. It's been very powerful, I think. Yeah, and just to sort of um, on that same thing is that we, uh, you know, back to the whole thing of assessment. So we assess them, they leave our class. Um, I, I'll get evaluations quite often that'll say, wow, you really put a lot of time into, you know, how if you've ever talked to me, I talk a lot. So I put a lot of time into the assessments and things. And also, you know, we just came from the narcissistic um, session where, but a lot of pep talks. Yes, you can do it, right? That cheerleader type thing. But um, in the end, um, that's what they're, we're there for is to put that time. Assessment takes a lot of time if you really want to do it well, but that's part of that whole process and encouraging them to, to continue. This is your final project, but it can get better after this course. So, you know, keep it up, keep working and, and iterate, right? Keep it, keep refining until it gets better. And I think that's our, jo our job as well as to motivate through assessment. All right. Any final words? Okay, so um, what I heard today is there's, or what I, what I think I saw is a lot of creative ways to assess your students. I mean, you guys give us all sorts of different examples and varying and, and opportunities. So, um, so in teaching or assessment, I see two things that, that you all become artists in. One, you're, you become artists in creating your assessments, creating your assignments and, and how to measure your students' success. And the other one is also a sort of a nuance there, but the um, becoming an artist in designing rubrics. I, th I think that's a very tricky and difficult, and, and it's a, an ongoing, iterative an iterative <laughs> process, very much so. so. So thank you so very much. I appreciate your comments today, and, and if any of you have questions here afterwards, you can go ahead and ask the panel. So thank you. <laughs>